problems with a long piece of work and you don't know what the story is, step out, line it. The way you step out, line it is just a series of numbers. And you are allowed to put a number and a sentence down for every time something happens in the work. Now, a heartbreaking is something happening. It doesn't have to be action. It doesn't have to be movement. But somebody moving out of a house is movement. Two people talking in a room for 20 pages, you get one sentence. Mm -hmm. OK? Any questions so far? When I have one. When you say, tell the story, I think a lot of us as writers tend to overdo it the first time. And I think you're suggesting a rather simple, I'm talking about when you're doing the book review that you suggested. Yeah. Rather simplistic statement of who, and what his problem is, and where he's trying to go with this, what he wants. Right. Right. To many, many beginning writers, new writers, struggling writers always have three, four, five ideas that they want to deliver. Yeah. Exactly. And I say you find the single driving force in the work and then ring as many changes on that as you want. But don't throw three, four, or even two thematic, conflicting thematic statements into the work. Because you're just confusing the reader, let alone confusing yourself. And how can you have one line, create atmosphere, define character, and advance the action, if there's two different actions or two different points of view going on? OK? Anybody? OK, shall we read? Okay. Um, who's got something? Matt's got something. Rules for reading in this workshop, okay? It's easy to be a critic. Anybody can be a critic. Anybody can tear apart a piece of work. The art of criticism is putting the work back together after you've torn it apart. So if you tear it apart and can't put it back together, <coughs> you're not being helpful to the writer. The way to be helpful to this writer is to listen positively. We're going to tell him what his strengths are. We're going to tell him what we like about the work. On my theory that you can't do a hell of a lot about your writing weaknesses, but you can do everything about your strengths. If you find out you're witty, try to be witty a lot. You know, watch yourself in your personal lives, in your social lives. If you bore people, if you notice that every time you walk <laughs> up to someone, they take three steps back, or you hear, or your own <coughs> eyes glaze over, then you're in serious difficulty. I mean. Think about helping this writer be always charming or suspenseful or whatever it is, but tell him what you like about the work. Also, I am going to arbitrarily cut him off early on or maybe late on, depending on how much of a page turner this is. <coughs> I don't like to listen to anything except beginnings because I think beginnings set the entire tone for the entire work. But I will cut him off when something has clearly happened, something has clearly taken place, or when it becomes all too distressingly obvious that nothing is going to take place. Okay, and then I will be the lightning rod. I will criticize, and because that's my job. Hmm. Okay. Go. This is uh, two and a half pages. <laughs> you hope that can beat you before you cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a prologue to a. Uh, novel. It's called Afterlife, The Adventures of a Lost Soul. Uh, it's about life after death. No, we'll, we'll tell you what it's about. Okay, you got to tell me what it's about. Yeah, well, hang on a minute, but, okay. which reminds me, that's one of the games here. We're a committee of the whole. If this is a novel, we're a publishing group that is gravely in debt. We've had three bombs in a row because our marketing experts have told us that the people were dying for our last three books. But the books died, not the people. <laughs> and the reason is they calculated what people want, and we're going to tell him now we're in desperate straits. We're anxious for this book to be a winner and that we, it's something we want to publish. We're, so we're going to tell him what we think the book is about, not what he tells us it's about, what the material tells us it's about. Okay? Fair enough. Okay. I'll just take it from the top. <coughs> it was dark. He was numb and disoriented. Then he opened his eyes and looked around slowly. About 30 feet in front of him, several people crowded around a van. He walked up to them and craned his neck to see what was going on, but his view was obscured. When he tried to tap someone on the shoulder, he jerked his hand back as if he were shocked. 
felt as if his finger had gone through the person. Dumbfounded, Steve examined his hand and gasped. He could see right through it. He looked down at his body. It had the same translucent quality, but was otherwise unflawed. He panicked. Without thinking, he walked through the solid bodies of the people in the crowd, drawn by an intense interest in what was happening with the van. When he made it to the front of the crowd, he inhaled sharply. A motorcycle like his was crushed beneath the vehicle with a mangled body twisted within the wreckage. He stumbled around to the other side of the wreck and found himself staring at his own blood-soaked inanimate body. One glazed eye stared lifelessly back at him, the other dangled halfway down his cheek. The sight made his knees give way. His body sagged as the darkness tried to claim him once again. He managed to hold on, but a wave of confusion enveloped him. He struggled to rationalize his experience as a dream, but it had a surrealistic quality that heightened its vividness. A moment later, the answer became clear. I'm not dreaming, I'm dead. The sight of his mutilated body was bad enough, but the final devastating blow came when he turned around and found himself confronted with Jeff, Al, and Jenny. Their ashen faces were each drawn taut in grimaces of horror and disgust. Steve ran to them screaming, but they didn't acknowledge his presence. Jenny buried her head in Al's shoulder and sobbed while Al and Jeff looked on helplessly. Steve was overcome with emotion himself and tried to speak again, but all that came out was a series of unintelligible sounds. His despair quickly turned to anger, frustration, then a wave of hopelessness. His anguish was unsurpassed by anything he could remember. Though he was in emotional turmoil, he had no physical sensations. He cried without tears, feared without chills or dryness of throat. He felt nothing on his skin except a limited sense of touching, as if his whole body were encased in a giant glove. Gone were the textures and temperatures of his normal life. He could feel the pull of gravity holding him down, yet he had no sense of weight, and his perceptions went no further than his emotions. As the initial shock wore off, the full weight of what had happened enveloped him, his mind like an unwelcome fog rolling in off the ocean. The impact of his revelation was unbearable, especially when he thought about the people he loved, particularly Heather. His heart went out to her more than anyone. The ambulance came and he stared mutely as the paramedics extricated his body from the wreck and put a sheet over it. You don't happen to have the first page of chapter one? Here sure. Time, do you? <laughs> Give us the first page. Yeah. First few paragraphs, anyway. Okay, chapter one. Cut me off whenever you want. Right. Right. <laughs> 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 Steve Harmon's dreams had become more bizarre with each passing day. Don't do it, Max. A voice said from somewhere inside his head. Are you sure you can drive? Jenny asked as they walked out from the crowded party into the clear moonlit night. No problem. Are you positive? Don't worry. Hey, lightweight Al Taunted, are you sure you can handle all that machine? That's an awful lot of fight for a penny waste like you. Oh, okay. I got it. Okay. <coughs> Anyone? You want to start by? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I, I really like this. It's, it's got a good feel to it. And um, the translucent stuff is, is, is interesting. And I kept wanting more. I mean, the guy's been alive, and so we all know what that means. And I kept wanting more of the other stuff. Like, you, you, you did a little bit. I wanted more of what he s didn't smell and what he, what he was trying to do to orient himself in that world that, that he's suddenly in. And the, the shock will be a, a lot heavier if we, can, if we can get some more of that. Like, he can still see. So, but can he hear and can he smell and you know, what can he touch and how good is it and all that stuff. Um, Steve, Steve is the protagonist, and it, it sounds like we're going to a flashback, but I, I'm not as fast as, as Sid. I have the feeling that it's a love story. Uh, for some reason, it sounds like a love conquers all, and that includes time and, and the fourth dimension and all that other stuff. And uh, the genre feels like science fiction. <laughs> Anyone else? Ellen? I'm um, very interested in that subject myself. I, I had um, a couple of pickies besides that. Uh, when, he, when he inhaled sharply, I thought, how could he do that? Isn't he dead? And so perhaps his comment that we need to know exactly what he can do to see, you know, 
But I, I rather doubted that he in, could inhale sharply if he was translucent. Somehow I didn't think he was breathing anymore. Hey. Um, <laughs> hey. I just didn't feel it.